Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, we're just letting people join in. So bear with us whilst we distribute the link. Everyone's just turning on now. We are, we are about to go live, just setting up. We are nearly there. Hello and welcome back to the uh, live build series. Um, with us today, we've got Josh, we've got Chris, and we've got Mark. Hello, everybody. Welcome, everybody. How are you doing there, fella? Hi, mate, how are you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. Um, we're just waiting for all the cameras to come on live. Sorry for the long pause at the start of the video, but we were just distributing the link to try and make sure we get everybody in before we kick off. Uh, we don't want to lose anyone along the way. So just sending the last one out now. Okay, who have we got with us? So we have got Mark, uh, Stephen, Bill, uh, John, uh, Alan Poxon, Alban, Peter Loop, and Raymond. Raymond's from Germany. Okay, so what are we going to focus on today, Josh? Uh, so today we're going to be looking at finishing the sale. So uh, it's going to be a little bit longer today because there's quite a bit to go through. Uh, but we're going to be looking at certainly the leading edge in quite a lot of detail. Uh, we're going to be putting mesh onto our kites and then we're going to finish off by putting Dacron onto our kites. And from there, we'll have complete sales. Okay, awesome. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, let me just, uh, before we carry on, uh, let me just say thank you to everyone that has donated thus far. Um, we've got well over uh, £200 worth of people that have donated to the individual charities. So there's a good, um, a nice, nice good pot going in um, for lots of worthwhile causes. So thank you for that. And we will be uh, drawing the winners at the uh, last episode of the build, um, which is probably, I guess, two weeks, Josh. Yeah, so um, we're actually, we're going to have complete kites by next week. Um, but after next week, we're going to do a review of the project and then we'll announce the winners of the raffle then. Fantastic. Um, just a few more people joining in. We've got Devin. Hi, guys. Hi, Devin. How are you? Um, also, we've got Richard. Um, he joined us last time. Now, anyone that wants to... Um, join us in Zoom. I'm going to post the link now on the two Facebook and uh, YouTube chat. So if you want to come in and join us and ask questions, um, you're more than welcome. There's the Facebook and I'll just send over the YouTube. Uh, YouTube now. Okay. So Josh, you have the stage. Go for it. Fantastic. Right. So let's um, let's make a start then. So the first part we're going to start today, uh, we are going to start with the mesh on the leading edge. Now, I'm going to get this in early. Um, parts of this can be a little bit confusing. So if you guys do have any questions, fire them over. 
and we will get them answered as soon as possible as we go along. Um, but yeah, so we're going to start um, with cutting <laughs> yet again more reinforcements for the leading edge. So for this, you're going to need a soldering iron or a scalpel if that's what you've been using or whatever you're using to cut Dacron um, and your Dacron ready to be cut. So um, if we can, yeah, we'll, we'll make a start. So I'm going to heat up my soldering iron um, and I will explain where we're going to go from here. So we've had a few people uh, join us, so we might as well say hello to everyone. Devin's in, Rich is in, and good old Watty is in. Hello, everybody. Uh, hey, guys. Everybody having a good day? And Watty's drinking. Yeah. Just everyone, sharing the link. Yeah, feel, feel free to chat. You, you can always... Uh, you can always say hi. Don't don't feel like you can't jump in. So, if you've got anything to ask along the way, guys, just jump in. And... I didn't bring my whiskey last time I saw you guys, so I got I got round for you today. Ah, oh, nice, nice. <laughs> Good, awesome. man. Good man. Good Wadi, man. Wadi, the MVP. <clears throat> right. So here we go. Um, so my solar and iron's heating up, um, and all I'm going to do first of all is mark the points where we're going to cut for the reinforcements. So um, what we're going to do, we're going to make four cuts of, uh, I'm using a 50 mil Dacron, um, and we're going to do those at 10 centimeters long, and we need that four times. So all I'm doing is going along my Dacron and making marks at 10 centimeters each time. Uh, and then, like last week with the reinforcements, just gonna take this nice and slow with the soldering iron. Okay, so the bits that you're doing now, which which bits are these actually for? So these are the points on the leading edge, which are effectively covering the mesh as a reinforcement so that the mesh doesn't split at weak points. Okay. Um, you can add as many of these as you want, but these are going in the key crucial places. Can you, um, can you just repeat the dimensions? Yeah, so it's a 50 mil Dacron band. I'm using a black Dacron. You can use whatever color you want, but black is the best. Um, for my personal preference, uh, 50 mil by 10 centimeters. So 50 mil by 100 mil. Um, I do not have the imperial measurements for that, but it looks to be four so inches long. 50 millimeters by 100 millimeters. Yeah. Yeah, which, um, would, which would, would more or less be uh, four by two inch, yeah. Yeah. So um, they're all cut. Um, and so we don't need our soldering irons again for the time being, but we will need them later on. So keep those handy. Um, and all we're going to do, uh, by the longest dimension, we're going to just fold these in half. Um, so we should end up with 50 by 50. So the squares of DAC are on like this. And we need that four times. So folding your, your rectangles in half. Yeah, directly in half. So you're taking four inches or 10 centimeters directly in half to make the square. And so you should end up- have two, four 50 by 50 squares. Exactly like half. that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. You can use a wider Dacron for this if that's all you've got lying around. It's not crucially important. Um, but for further on, you will be needing a uh, 50 mil Dacron. So um, I got a great little invention by somebody in the post this week. Um, thanks to Dwight for uh, doing these. Oh, uh, Dwight he made us again. Some, he, he does. Uh, he made these um, adhesive holders, which I found so useful. Um, so just a little shout out to Dwight there for that. Um, but all we're going to do here is we're going to run adhesive along the folded edge. Um, 
of all four of these. I've just had a message from Dwight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I received the same message. So, yeah, just running it along a folded edge like that. Um, shall I close this blind so it's just the yeah. lights a little bit yeah, less? That, yeah, that would be perfect. Um, is that better? Yeah. Can you see yeah, you that's, yeah. yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Perfect. So, I'm just going to run along all four of those and you can do this in a way which saves wastage so you can literally just row them next to each other yeah go from one to the other to the other yeah yeah perfect is this a hard step for the novices sorry guys um I dropped out there for a second. Uh, am I still with you? Yeah, you're still still with us. You you coming in and out. But um, Chris was just saying, is this a, a particularly hard step for the beginners? I'll probably answer that one for you. This is this is not a a hard step. Um, you're you're literally cutting and sticking tape down. So yeah, it should be should be a good one to start off with. But I think it's going to get harder, right, Josh? It's absolutely going to get harder. Um, and it's going to get harder right now, actually. Okay. So you've got your four reinforcements. <laughs> um, we're now going back to our already sewn sails. So what you should have now, you should have your pre-cut mesh at 50 mil, uh, your sail and four reinforcements at 50 by 50 mil. Okay. Um, yeah, I've so, got, Josh, I've, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I know you want to crack on, uh, and I won't, I won't keep monopolising the time. But um, I just wanted to ask you on the cutting of the um, fifty mil wide strip of mesh. Yeah. Um, when you're cutting it, is there anything that you pay particular attention to? Like I'm a bit, I'm a bit um, OCD, and I sort of have to to cut so that I'm going from bar to bar in my 50 mil as opposed to having, you know, the little tails. Yeah, yeah, sense. of course. So um, is there, is there a, do you pay particular attention to something or do you just, you just cut it at will? Um, so what I'm doing, um, I'm always looking, like you said, going um, effectively, the mesh is made up of these tiny blocks um, and I'm looking at a nice smooth kind of Staying in that line of those those blocks, so you don't deter. Yeah. Um, you you get what I mean. Yeah, because um, otherwise you're, I guess you're effectively sort of wasting real estate because the the little tag bits, if you're including them in your fifty mil, I can't imagine they're particularly doing a lot. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, for this section um if you guys have still got your b1 panel um, template handy you'll see a red mark um along the leading edge and that's the center point of where the internal reinforcement needs to be um but if you haven't got your template handy it's 36 centimeters along the leading edge um, so the way i go about that um literally get a ruler and just measure along to 36 and just leave a little kind of pencil mark on the leading edge, but make it clear because you will need to be able to see that. Um, and again, you want to do that on both sides on the front of the sill. Um, just working along to 36. Uh, and mark at 36. Again, that's on the front of the sail. Um, and it's actually really important to mention right now that everything we're about to do until we get to the the next sort of step of putting the uh, Dacron tunnel on is on the front of the sail. So front of the sail until further notice. Exactly. So um, we've got the, the markings um, and there's another marking we need to make. So we want to go to the edge of the sail this time, um, and we're going to mark at three point five. Sorry, uh, I have my notes here. Yeah, three point five centimeters. Um, 
And you're going to just mark that on the front of the sail as well, at the edge of the type. So it's a uh, marking here, 3.5 centimeters in. And again, we're putting that on both sides. Okay. And now, all we're going to do, each marking, and we're going to take one of our reinforcements and line those up with the markings. So the first, first one you can see here. So I'm lining up the edge of the reinforcement, uh, the fold towards the top of the kite, as you see it at the moment. The edge of that reinforcement along with that marking. So that just literally right on the boundary of where that mark is. Okay. Um, I've just had a Facebook message through there. Um, it's a good question. The leading edge was not hemmed. So you should have a, the only edges should be hemmed are the side edges and the under edges of the kite. The leading edge should at this point be a raw kind of cut edge. So I'm gonna just, while I've got that, I'm gonna do the, both the outer reinforcements first, and then we'll move to the center reinforcements. Okay, okay. so just um, the, the, just going back, you, the, uh, the end reinforcements, they were, did you say halfway along? 3.5 centimeters in. 3.5 centimeters in, okay, yeah. Yeah, so I've, uh, how well you can see this yeah yeah okay yeah um, and again you're lining up flush with that mark that you make yeah perfect okay, okay. yeah that's nice and clear yeah so then next we're going to move on to the inside reinforcements um so all we're going to do is separate the reinforcements here so you can deal with them each and you just either want to mark or just fold halfway um along that folded line so you can actually see the center of this reinforcement. Um, you can mark it with a pencil or any way, but I find folding is just, it's just handy. And then, so now I can see that along this crease, I know that's the center of the reinforcement. And again, with the fold facing the top of the kite, I'm just gonna line up flush with the top of the kite here. And the, the mark I made is here. Um, I'm just gonna centralize that mark along the top of the leading edge so that you know that this is in the right place in line with that marking. Um, does that make sense, Matt, or? So, Josh, is this at the 36 centimeter mark? Yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, so that fold that you're doing, you're lining that up with 36 centimeter inside the cut. Awesome. Okay, um, and exactly the same on the other side. So make your mark on your reinforcement. You know it's there. As long as you can see it for your own good, you find the marking you've done previously on the sale. So again, you can see that my marking is there. I'm just lining up, fold, placing the top of the kite again. Mark up the line and let me slide on. Right, so we know that, um, we, so have you got have you got all of your reinforcements on there now? Or yes. So, yeah. So it can, can we hold it up and give a, a an overview of where we should currently have them relative to the side? So one on the air, like one on each end. One here. This is mirrored on both sides. So one on the outside of the kite. One thirty cent, uh, thirty six centimeters on the inside. Yeah. And the mirrored image exactly on the other side, on the end of 36 in. Okay, awesome. Okay, um, so next, what we need is we need our sewing machines and our pre-cut mesh. Okay, so, so time to get your sewing machines out, everyone. Yeah, I'm just going to rejig my little workspace here. Yeah, you go ahead, mate, you go ahead. And in the meantime... Um, Rich, I know that you were building along with us uh, last time. Have you got anything there to show us, your, your progress? 
Um, so far, I've, I've just cut the reinforcements, and I'm a little confused about the sticking the, the three point point five centimeters from the edge. Okay, that's that's going to be the inner edge of the, where the reinforcement attaches. So it actually overhangs the edge a bit, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So it will overhang the edge by one point five centimeters. Got it. Thanks. That's that will come. That will. The, the reason for doing that will become much more uh, apparent when the rest of the leading edge goes on and you'll see why you have to have that overlap. Okay. Um, let's see if we've got any questions. Is the mesh straight or curved? The mesh will be uh, straight. Mesh, yeah, um, a straight band at this point. Yeah, okay. And uh, let's see if we've got anything else. Uh, we've got Ian, Ian's in, uh, Ian Perks, hi Ian. Thanks for joining us, Jim Oates, uh, Geraldine. Uh, she's in from Watford. <laughs> Hi, Geraldine. Um, Hello, Geraldine. Um, Hi, wifey. Yes, that's Mark's wife. And uh, yeah, okay. So, any has anyone anyone in the chat like Watty or uh, Rich? I know you had a question. Watty, got any questions? Sure, I have a small question. Um, I'm, I think the reinforcements you have right now are obviously the two on the very edge, which you kind of need because you don't want raw um, mesh on the edge because that looks silly. Um, and then you've got a reinforcement at the folding point in the leading edge, right, to reinforce where you would be folding that mesh and it tends to crack there. So you're putting some reinforcement there. Some people like myself and also like John uh, Bressy on the gins tends to put a bunch of other little pieces of reinforcement along the leading edge as well just to deal with like the the horizontal tear that you get on the mesh sometimes. I wonder if you have any sort of opinion on, on throwing extra little reinforcements along that leading edge mesh just for that extra security. Um, I've seen a lot of people do it. Uh, and for sure, I think in some cases, it's a good idea. Um, I don't personally do it only because I, I think sometimes it disrupts the airflow across the mesh, but that's my personal opinion. Um, but yeah, for sure, I, it's it's an option if uh, if people want to do that. I I personally don't. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it's a good idea to have a few extra reinforcements at the fold points for sure. Right. Yeah, I think maybe one other slight note about the the mesh. I'm assuming we're just using everyone's using like straight up fiberglass mesh, like window mesh, is kind of the typical. Um, and I have seen like some manufacturers are using like a nylon or a polyester based one, which I have found really hard to find. Um, but it's sort of very similar in texture to the fiberglass, but it's less prone to that cracking because it's nylon instead of fiberglass. Um, I've been working on trying to get my hands on some, but I I'm waiting on that. <laughs> ah, there's a, a manufacturer in the UK that I, that I get my mesh from. And I very rarely have had any of it break. Um, it's the, the only time it tends to break is if you know if you have a bit of a too sharp an edge on your Dacron. Um, but apart from that, I've never really had anything break because of wear and tear with it. Uh, right, are we ready to continue, Matt? Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. I see that you've got your sewing machine all set up and you, you're ready to go. Absolutely. Right, so... Um, for, the, for this section, we're going to be using a straight stitch. Uh, I use a three millimeter stitch, but you can use whatever your preference is. Uh, I would advise not going longer than four millimeters, um, only because this needs to be uh, partially a strength seam for the kite. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm using a three millimeter stitch. Um, so I'm, we're sewing along a line here of that's 15 mil, uh, millimeter inside the leading edge. So you can see, if I just show you here, um, that, uh, yeah, so it's not flush to the edge. We are actually 15 millimeters inside of, this is your, your leading edge, raw edge. And yeah, we're 15 millimeter inside there. Sewing, sewing the reinforcements on first. Yes, uh, no, no, oh, we're doing oh. it all in one. Oh, we're doing it all in one. Okay, right. Um, sorry, before you carry on, we just had another question um, from Jane that wants to know the length of the mesh and the Dacron leading edge. Oh, sorry. Um, right, so the 
I don't give specific measurements for the mesh. Um, I, I say two meters is a good size to cut for this. Um, sorry, two and a half meters. But um, the that's kind of um, how do you say? It? Kind of it's, determined. It's, it's, it's quite probably. over. Yeah, two and a half probably will be quite over what you'll end up having. But you need the excess to cover you in the in the, the process, right? Yes. Um, and because we're building the leading edge on the kite, um, it, it's not that important to have an exact amount as long yeah. as you have a minimum amount. Because you're going to make it um, exact in as as you go along. So, um, just, so just to answer Jane, the, the, if you start with two and a half meters of both Dacron and mesh, um, that should cover you um, more than enough for the for the process that Josh is about to show you. Right, so um, you can see that I've got my reinforcement lined up in the machine. And like I said, I'm 15 millimeters inside of the leading edge. What I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna tuck, but not completely the mesh inside this reinforcement. So that's between the two layers of Dacron, not between the Dacron and the sail. So that effectively your mesh is sandwiched in between the Dacron. Um, and you're gonna do it about 25 mil along the Dacron, and you'll see why after we've done this step. Um, but it's important that you don't put the mesh flush to the edge of this reinforcement. Um, and so what you're doing is you're looking and aligning your mesh with the edge of the kite, you can see there. Um, and you want to keep that as straight as possible and as aligned as possible throughout the stitch. Um, I'm going to start the stitch by locking it in. So I'm going to go three back and then three forward, and I know my stitch is locked in. So I'm just gonna, so that's three back. Now I'm just going forward to lock that in. Again, this is all being sewn at 15 millimeter. And all we're going to do, we're going to run this 15 mil line inside this stitch all the way along the leading edge, securing the mesh. Um, I'm going to stop at certain intervals along here and just explain where I'm doing, especially at the reinforcements. But yeah, so we're keeping so that can... line. Sorry, Josh, I know you're about to sew. Can you can you just give us a slight overhead of the arrangement that you've currently got so people can see exactly what you're about to do? Uh, yeah, so perfect. Yeah, that's it. That's so yeah, you can see you've got your mesh sitting on the, the front edge with your reinforcements and we're sewing a line 15 mil in from the top. Yeah. Um, you will see that, that many machines have these alignment marks. Um, so I know that 15 mil on this machine, and it's from the point where the needle is. It's not from the edge of uh, the container as such. That running it along with this four mark is 15 millimeters. Yeah, I, I also am one of those people that likes to put a bit of tape on my machine because those those engraved lines, my my poor little eyes can't see. So I, I actually put a tape on the a bit of tape on the outside. So. Uh, you just got that clear marker to run up against. Right, so I'm going to start running that stitch. Um, and if you guys have any questions, just as I'm going along, I'm going to take this quite slow and bear in mind that you want to keep the stitch as straight as possible, aligned with the 15 millimeter mark. That, that's a very important point. So just taking it nice and slow across the reinforcement, especially. And what you want to do, you want to keep a bit of tension in the in your hand with the sail and the mesh so that it doesn't pucker as you go along um, you can glue this down but um i personally advise not to i think it's much easier to do it without gluing it in place so and i suppose gonna... it also it also gives you ultimately a, i guess a better finish because the mesh uh obviously being open can expose the glue uh, the the tape to a degree um, which you see, I mean, it's purely an aesthetic thing, but um, yeah, just if you can do it without, it's another extra bonus. We have a question in chat, Josh. Someone is asking what kind of thread are you using currently? Uh, that's a great question. I'm using a Gutterman also. Um, polyester thread is brilliant for making kites. Uh, you can use cotton, but don't be surprised if it fails. Um, Right, so I'm coming up to the second reinforcement now, um, and you can see that there's 
the meshes on the inside of this reinforcement as well. And that's going to be the case for all these reinforcements. So the stack run is already glued to the sail. So you're placing the mesh in between, again, like a sandwich. Um, and all we're going to do is we're going to continue that stitch across the top of this reinforcement. Again, 15 millimeters in. And as you get there, again, I suggest just taking it a little bit slower the machine the time to work through that stack one. Uh, Josh, we have another question from Geraldine. Um, uh, it says, could I sew it on my machine that only does straight stitch if I put in two rows? Um, this is only a single, um, a single row of stitching that's required at this stage. So for this, yes. Um, and once we get to the next step, I'll explain how you can do that with a stitch zigzag and a straight stitch if you don't have a zigzag option. Um, but essentially, yes. She's also well, asking fails after how long? Um, that's, that's kind of relative. Um, I guess if you're flying your kite on a beach and it's getting covered in salt and that stitching is gonna fail a lot sooner than if you're flying in a clean kind of air and it's not seeing much damage. Um, but yeah, if you can, just, just use polyester and you won't be faced with that problem. Or certainly not as often. I guess it also depends on um, how well you actually put the kite together and how careful you are on stitching and so on and so forth. Yes. So obviously your kites will last for a lifetime. Yeah, this is still just taking this nice and slow, making sure that you're applying pressure so you're not getting any of that puckering. Um, I appreciate that the camera's getting collided no, with the camera. No, 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 we're, we're, we're getting a good shot there. Um, we can see the, the nitty gritty of the machine. So, uh, yeah. One one quick call out. Um, since the you're using one, in this case, you're using one long mesh piece across the whole um, the whole thing. And I found that yeah. like a little bit annoying to try to cut out a super long piece like that. Um, and so usually I'll, you know, I get like a 60 inch roll. I don't know what it is in centimeters, whatever. You get the normal roll. And so I'll cut horizontally on the roll. And then I usually have a DAC run reinforcement in the middle. And so I'll go to that middle point and then switch over to a, the next strip of mesh. So I actually have a break yeah. in the mesh that's sandwiched, <clears throat> that's sandwiched in DAC run. So that way I can get away with not having to cut lengthwise into the roll, I can cut horizontal in the roll and it's just a little bit nicer to deal with sometimes. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've done that myself on larger kites uh, as well. Um, yeah, the, the, um, the, the couple of kites that I've made, um, I've used uh, sections of uh, mesh and hidden them in the Dacron reinforcement. So yeah, that's a good shout out. If you, uh, if you don't want to cut big long um, strips, you can obviously um, butt them up underneath the, the reinforcement if you so wish. And they're, they're using the same method, right, Josh? Um, yeah, exactly the same method. Um, if you are going to do that, I would suggest you have just a little bit of overlay um, at the point where you are joining those meshes just first um, so that it doesn't stretch and you lose kind of a, the shape of the mesh. Um, you can see now that I've just reached, again, the third reinforcement, and it's exactly the same as the other side. You're just making sure that it's sandwiched between the reinforcement and you're just keeping that 15 millimeter stitch going all the way. So I'm going gonna... to I'm gonna, uh, answer Jim's question, Jim Oates, um, on Facebook. Um, the good news for you, Jim, is that this is a build series. So if you look back through our videos, you'll see a part one, a part two, and obviously the part three that we're doing now, and there'll be a couple of other parts. There's a few posts um, with the plans and the, the build list and so on and so forth. If any of it, if you can't find any of it, um, what I would suggest is after tonight's show, send us a message and we can send you a link to all the bits. But Josh has very kindly made the plans available for free. Um, so it's not something that you uh, have to buy as such. Um, so yeah, by all means, if you can't find any of it, get in touch and we'll, we'll point you in the right direction. So where are we up to so now, I, Josh? 
I'm just about to finish sewing the mesh to the kite. Um, and I've stopped here for a reason that um, the, the next thing I want to show you guys is, so as I said at the beginning, you want to stop sewing the mesh in before you reach the end of the reinforcement. And again, we'll get to that, why that's important in the next few steps. Um, but what I've done, so because I know I started halfway with the previous, uh, the previous side, um, I've marked the halfway point. And again, you can do this by measuring or folding and um, what the way you go around it is not particularly important. Um, and you just want to cut the mesh at that halfway mark uh, uh, so that it's not extruding further than the reinforcement. Um, and let's just grab some scissors. Um, and I'm going to do this on the kite. I'd suggest you guys do it on the kite as well. You don't need to mark it. You can see you follow the, the line of the mesh. And there you can see that that stopped halfway along the reinforcement. Does anybody and, in the Zoom chat have a question? Right. So just going to show you how you guys how to complete this. So it's very much like starting it off. Continue that 15 millimeter. 15 millimeter seam. And as you feel like you're getting to the edge of the kite, just then start to step backwards to lock that off. And then just complete the stitch. And I just lock it off at the end as well, just to be sure. Um, and that's the first step of applying the mesh to the leading edge. Um, yeah. Awesome. So you so the mesh is actually finishes. Um, what would you say? Is there a sort of a rough measurement of, of uh, how far short it finishes uh, right on the tip of the, the kite? Is that? Yes. Yeah, so actually, if you go halfway along, it's, it finishes slightly before the end of the kite. Yeah. But that's a good thing. And you'll yeah. understand why as we move on. OK, so that, that's intentional. We want the mesh to finish be just before the, the end of the kite. And that's at both ends, right, Josh? Yes, both ends. Yeah, we uh, like started I... it slightly inset and we finished it slightly inset. Yeah. Right, so all we're going to do now, um, we're actually going to work on the back of the sail for this part. Um, so is the, is the lighting okay, guys? Can you, can you see this? Yeah, we can see that. We can see that. Right. So where we've got the reinforcements now, we're going to go to the back of the sail and we're going to feel the reinforcements and we're going to fold the top of the reinforcement to that 15 millimeter line. So folding it over the back so it matches and runs along set with that stitching line. So for, um, I, I take it at this point, it's going to be a similar step to doing the hem and the uh, sides that we did last week, right? Exactly that. So okay. you're folding from the outside to the 15 mil line. So the lucky, the, the benefit at this point is that we have a line to fold to because we've already just stitched it. So in the same way that we uh, folded to 14 mil last week, we're going to 15 mil the sewing line this week. So first step is to sew to the, uh, to fold to that line on the back of the kite. Remember the we back switched the to the back of the kite now. Right. Um, so yeah, so we fold it to that. And all I'm going to do, um, you can do this with a folding bone or a ruler. Um, it's completely up to you. But just reinforce that fold. And that'll make the next step again a lot easier. Um, I'll explain why when we get to that. But all we're going to do, we're going to go along the leading edge and do that at each reinforcement. So it's just folding from the outside. So we're, not going, we're not going all the way down the kite as such we're just we're folding and and reinforcing that fold at each of the reinforcements and um, that's a good point you can if you feel more comfortable go all the way along the kite but um it's not completely necessary um but yeah just i'm just doing the reinforcements but like i say you can do the entire leading edge um, and again so this is the third one it's the same process from the outside to that line reinforce that with a ruler and finally, the last one. 
Okay, so Dan and Ingeborg just uh, joined on Facebook. So they are also watching on live. If either that, of you that, want to join the Zoom room, uh, that is the Dan, the Dan that is part of Team Fracture. Dan the man. Dan the man. Happy birthday, Dan. It's not his birthday. I'm only joking. <laughs> uh, Dan's here. I just want to know where's Brian. <laughs> yeah, where is Brian? Eh? <laughs> uh, right. Um, are we happy to move on? Let's see if we've got any questions. Anyone got any questions from this part on Facebook, in Zoom, or on YouTube? Anyone at all? I think we're okay to move on, Josh. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to switch the camera to this side, um, and hopefully that will give you guys a little bit more view of what I'm actually doing. Um, yeah. Just bear with me. I apologize about this constant adjustment. Um, how is that? Is that a clear view? Yes, that is very right. clear. And what he, what he just mentioned that he, uh, he bought a um, folding bone um, after yes. watching your video. Now, I have to say, I know them as bone folders. So if anyone is after a folding bone, as you've seen in Josh's video of last week, um, you may have to search for bone folder. Um, um, and I would love to know what did you find it to be advantageous? I don't usually get, I just came in the mail the other day and I'm waiting on materials for my current build. So I haven't really, haven't been able to use it yet, but I'm looking forward to doing that. You'll have to let me know how you get on with it. Cause I, when I first discovered them, I thought, ah, oh, this is amazing. It's something so simple that I need it. <laughs> um, right, so next up, um, you need to switch your machines across to back to the same stitch we used to sew the sail, uh, which is that triple stitch zigzag. Um, again, mine is four millimeter, uh, sorry, five millimeter wide at four millimeter long. Um, and what we're going to do, again, sewing on the back of the kite this time. So we've just done our folds, um, and you can see that. Once you pull the, the mesh tight, the, the fold which we've just done tucks underneath the back of the kite. Um, can you see that? So this, this fold here goes underneath the mesh and it's folded underneath the back of the kite. I apologize about this video. So we should have effectively yeah. So, so you're folding, you're folding back on itself. Yeah, back under. Yeah. Uh, and this is on the back of the kite. One note that you might look for is that when you have that fold, and looking at the front of the kite, you'll see a, a very clear division from ripstop to mesh. Where on the back yes. of the kite, the overlap between mesh and ripstop. Yeah. It looks much cleaner on the front. Um, I'm going to actually show you guys um, just what we're looking for with this. Um, it might be... So this is a, a full pulse that I completed just the other day. Um, but what we're looking for... <laughs> you fell over. Um, oh, I can't adjust. <laughs> um, so we're folding underneath that fold and that's going to run along the entire back of the kite. Um, so you can see that this is folded. This is the fold we've just done going to the back of the kite. Um, just, yeah. Is that clear enough for everybody? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Right. Let's, uh, let's take. Right. So, have we got any more questions? Uh, oh, Per Anderson is asking what kind of machine you're using, Josh? I'm using a FAF 122E. Brilliant machine with a walking foot. If you can get a machine with a walking foot, that is going to help you out so much. And that's got an actual, it's got a built in walking foot as opposed to uh, a third party add on as such. Yeah, but you, the, but you, wise to mention the third party add ons there. They are not as wired in with the machines, but they are a good addition 
um, regardless of them being third party. Yeah, so, so w- well worth getting. Yeah. Right, so I'm going to continue with this uh, now. So we've done our folds. We've began, uh, began to fold it under the kite. So what we're going to do with our three-step zigzag is we're just going to lock in that first stitch. Which my machine is deciding not to do. There you go. And there we go. So I'm locking that stitch in. So the stitch is locked in. Um, and I'm actually, I am going to, sorry. You're absolutely fine, mate. You're absolutely fine. We're. Uh, it's difficult to get the sort of shots that, that um, we're looking for and actually achieving. So it's absolutely fine. Josh, I have kind of a, a cheeky question. Yep. You spend a lot of time in front of your sewing machine, so you're constantly hearing the sound of the sewing machine. If you could change the sound of the sewing machine to any sound in the world, what would you change it to? <laughs> um, do you know what? Um... <laughs> That's a pretty good one, Chris. I like that. Yeah, so how do you answer this politely? Um, <laughs> I, I think I would actually make my sewing machine silent, to be honest. Um, is, is silence changing a noise or is that losing noise? I think that's, I think that's more than acceptable. Silent yeah. is, silence is golden. Right, um, so what, what I've done now um, is I've continued that fold along to the mesh. And actually this fold is going to continue all the way along the leading edge. Um, and it's the same folds we've just done. And as Matt said before, you can do this before you sew the leader, uh, the mesh on. Um, so, <laughs> oh, that's so wrong. Sorry, somebody just sent me a message and uh, I was talking about tasteful answers and this was not a tasteful answer. <laughs> no, I, no, no. Right, so I'm gonna start sewing this in um, and it's using that three step zigzag. So I can see now that the needle has just aligned with this, um, the edge of the kite. So I'm going to relock in the stitch because we're actually going to take this excess off in a minute. Um, so again, doing that and then reversing the stitch. So I know that's locked in now. And because we've got that predetermined fold, the mesh follows suit. So we're just going to follow that along the entire way and stitching it as we post. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to hold the sail and the mesh at the same time to do this. Um, and you want to add a little bit of pressure so that you separate the two. So you get a nice clear line to find along that leading edge. And what you can see is that locks in and it's nicely folded under, and that's what we're looking for all the way along the leading edge. Um, can you see that? Yeah, very, very, very crisp and clean. And, yeah. Um, and you're gonna do this, I do this in about five, 10 centimeter jumps. So just sew a little bit, fold more under, sew a little bit, and just take it easy as you go along. Take, take your time and make sure you get it right. I've got done a length, and now I'm just getting the next section ready. So folding that under, making sure it's nice and tight, that there's a clear separation, again, by pulling away. And so again, folding under, nice and clean, add the pressure and stitch. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it sounds like to everyone else, but um, he's got some fantastic noise cancellation on that that, that phone because the machine sounds totally silent uh, once you get going. Nobody else was hearing the moose. <laughs> so I've reached the reinforcement here, um, and because it's pre-folded, it does follow that form. Um, so, yeah, you're just going to keep an eye on it and make sure that that fold hasn't slipped or that the tension hasn't come away from the back of the sail. Um, and what I mean by that is where you're separating this, sometimes if you don't keep a constant pressure separating them, 
they can it can slip and you can get um, effectively a, a ruffle on the front of the sail. So you're just constantly making sure that that fold's still there and still applying the same amount of pressure. And I'll say this again, take this part easy. Um, it's so, so important. Yeah, it's not, it's not an easy technique, um, especially if you're somewhat new to sewing. So yeah, don't, don't uh, try and take on too much all in one go. Just, uh, it doesn't matter if it takes you hours to do, it'd be far more satisfying to fly once you, you get it as sharp as you can. Someone asked before, um, if you don't have the zigzag stitch available, can you do it with a straight with a straight stitch? And you absolutely can. Um, if you run a straight stitch just along this the lower edge of the mesh, um, it effectively has the same uh, the same action, and it doesn't really change the way the kite will fly because you have a straight stitch locking the mesh in place anyway. Um, so yes, you can absolutely use a straight stitch for that. And would you use two rows of straight stitch? Um, again, that's also an option. Um, I, I probably would, yeah, just to be a little bit safer. So that I guess it's A, that it locks in place and B, probably helps retain its shape towards the top as well. Yeah, exactly that. Uh, do we have any other questions coming in? Mark, this... Mark looked like he had a, a, a question. But you're muted, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, it's everything. Everyone always has to get used to it. Uh, <laughs> sitting there on mute and yeah. The Sorry, space bar's not working. Uh, yeah. Does that mean we can do the rest of the zigzag on the kite, the previous zigzags, with a double stitch if uh, they don't have a uh, straight, uh, if they only have a straight stitch? Um, you can, yes, you, you can actually um, do that. And I've seen it done in some cases. Um, I can't remember who the sail maker was, um, but there was a, a builder who did all their panelled work with that style. Um, and it, you can absolutely do it. The, because these t uh, seams are glued, effectively any way you can make sure that the, the panels aren't going to slip, um, you're, just, you're just locking the panels in place. So yeah, if you want to use um, double row of straight stitching to do the panels, yeah, by all means, you can do that. Uh, okay. But my fundamental, like I would suggest if you've got the option, use a triple stitch. Okay. I think one thought like in, as a warning when using straight stitches is that to, to bear in mind about how the distance between the stitches, because the fear is if the stitch is too close together, you're essentially perforating um, the sail. And so since these panels have a horizontal, you know, pressure that's perpendicular to the stitch, it's like when you have a perforated paper, it can really easily tear, right? So if you're going to use a st straight stitch, maybe have those stitches a little bit farther apart so that it's not such a clear perforation. Um, and that's where the zigzag is, is nice, is that it doesn't create such a straight perforation that's really easy to tear. That's yeah, some great that advice. Makes sense. That, that's, that's some, yeah, that, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that uh, you don't think about. And then as soon as someone tells you, you get, ah, uh, yeah, that makes total sense. So halfway through, Josh. Just over. And uh, one of the things I would make clear is I, I've done this a million times and it's still the part of building a kite, which I find a little bit daunting. Um, so, yeah. I will say it a million times and a million times over. Just take it easy on this. Yeah, well, I mean, if your previous speed is anything to go on, uh, this is, is very clear that this is the most difficult part because uh, all the other the bits would have, like, were completely done at this point. Um, we did mention at the start of the video, it is, and we did mention it last week, it's going to be an extended session um, because... The complexity of of, of this um, area, and uh, it allows us to just do it all in one go. But yeah, we can we can definitely see your your pace is somewhat slower than it has been in previous weeks, Josh. So to everyone else well, at home, take your time. I also haven't had a Red Bull yet, so that kind of like. Oh, I mean, we're an hour in, and there's been no Red Bull. It's because you just. 
just uh, you've been telling us all what to do. So yeah. what else have we? Uh, what else have we got? So, oh yeah, it's all right. Just had a message from John. <laughs> uh, he was going to join us from the shower, but then he thought better of it. So, <laughs> thanks, John. Thanks for considering us all. Um, okay, so done the third reinforcement. You're on the home straight now, Josh. I am. And as I get to the last reinforcement, I'm just going to explain to you guys how I finish this off. Um, bear in mind that for the majority of this, this section, it's all the same process. It's just making sure that it's nice and flat and well folded under and just basically stitching forward. Um, Are you completely self-taught, Josh, or did you attend any classes or anything? Um, I actually had a, um, I call it, call it like a mentor. Um, this guy that I flew kites with for a long time, really good friend of mine called oh, John well. Weimark. Yeah. Um, and he taught me how to go kites. Um, so I'm very close to the end now. Um, and I just want to show you guys. So this part here can sometimes um, destroy a leading edge. Um, it's very easy for the last reinforcement to creep away from you. Um, so what I suggest is just making sure that folds in there and just holding this part really, really tight while you stitch it. Um, and as you get to the edge of the seam that we did last week, so the, this outside seam, that's when you want to start considering that you're going to have to go back on yourself and lock it off. Um, so you're trying to align your last stitch with the edge of the kite to go back on yourself to finish that off. It's, it's um, also probably worth noting, sorry to, to button Josh, but um, although you yeah, apply decent pressure, but don't, uh, don't hold the material back from going through the machine. There's some machines out there that, that won't have as much fight perhaps as the machine you've got and uh, won't drag it through quite so easily. So if you apply too much resistance, you might just have the needle sitting there going back and forth in the same spot as opposed to uh, taking the material through. So just a nice even pressure, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, never restrict the machine from doing its work, just to, uh, apply guidance pressure. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna run this along and hopefully you guys can see this. Um, so I'm waiting for the point where the stitch is gonna line up with that last seam. And that it's just past that point now. So I need to bear in mind that. We can't, we, oh. can you just push the, that's it, yep. that's it. So you can see that the, the needle is just on the edge of where the seal is going to be. So I'm just going to reverse that now, just to lock that seam in. Um, and then once, because it's been locked in, you can just continue to run forward the stitch. And that's the mesh on the cut. Oh, sorry, that's creeped up again. Um, no, we did yeah. see it. We did see it. It only lifted up right at the end. We, we did see it. Okay. Um, we're going to, there's, there's quite a bit of um, jumping back and forward here, um, but we actually need to go back to our soldering irons now. That's um, fine. That's fine. And whilst you get set up, I will um, talk briefly about, uh, well, first of all, is there anything you need to tell people in setting up their soldering iron? What do they need? Um, same as last week, really. Uh, same tip. So we're using a fine kind of that fine kind of needle tip. Um, uh, what else? Uh, yeah, don't start soldering iron on your carpet, I guess. <laughs> okay, that's a good shout. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to grab the video here and say, uh, right, to everyone that has already donated, thank you very much. We, I cannot believe how much money some of you out there have donated. It's crazy uh yeah crazy amounts um remember all you have to donate to be entered into winning one of the two kites that uh josh is building and has already built is just three pounds three euros or three dollars you donate it to the charity of your choice so we're not asking for any money but it's not coming to us it's literally you're going to send that money um to whoever you like 
uh, a charity of your choice, send us a, the proof, okay, and you will be entered into the draw. Now, if you donate $120, you will be entered in that, that many times. Um, no. <laughs> no. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, you, you, we will take that amount, uh, we will divide it by three, and that is how many times you will be entered in. So 40, if you, if you donated 120, you'll be entered in 40 times. If you donated 60, um, we'll, we'll enter you 20 times. So um, it's up to you. You, won't, you only have to donate uh, a denomination of three to be entered. So three pound, three dollars, three euros, and... Uh, you can win either the the, the um, mini pulse that's in the promo video, or the pulse that the mini pulse that Josh is currently building. Um, so it's well worth it. Now, do we have any questions currently? We have two questions. Fantastic. Okay. Let's... We have a question from Mark. Um, a question from last week, he says, has anyone had any success using a hemming foot on their machine? And then in chat, Jim Oates is asking if he can see Josh's finished uh, mesh. Yes, definitely. Um, so from the front, um, the mesh should look like this. Uh, that's upside down, sorry. Um, and from the back, uh, like that. Okay, so the front is nice and smooth with really clear definition between the mesh and the rest of the fabric. And on the back, you have just a, a, a just tiny seam. seam, yeah, um, that's nice and flat and crisp. So, yeah, very clear. Like now, the, the other question was, uh, Mark about the hemming foot. So, Josh, have you have you ever heard of anyone using a hemming foot around the? Um, I know people do use them. I personally don't like using them. Um, I find them quite unreliable. Um, but I know some people do choose to use them. Do you think that's because of the Icarex, or it is being quite slippery, or they just just by design they don't work very well? Um, I'm not going to say by design they don't work well because they do have their places where they are, you know, very, very valuable. But for kite building, I, I, I don't use them. I mentioned that I don't, I don't use one either, but I do use a bit. There's this little arm thing that I have that there's a screw hole in the base of my sewing machine. And so it's this arm that I can screw into the base there and it has a little shelf. Um, and so I can have the folded hem and just press the hem up against that shelf. And it, that way it kind of forces me to have a super straight line. Like it's a little bit of a physical guide. So that sort of thing I found to be really helpful. It gets a little bit funky when you get into the like center of the V, but um, yeah, having that, that physical barrier is kind of nice to get really nice straight lines. Yes. Yeah. And I would say like it's, it's sewing is definitely one of those things where, I don't think you can have enough aids. So if there's little things that you can do to adapt your machine to get the result you want, go for it because uh, it's only going to help the finished product in the end, especially if you're new to, to sewing like uh, certainly I am. Okay, Josh, you're ready. You're poised with your soldering iron. What, what, yeah, what? I'm just uh, taking notes. Hold on. Right, um, so... The red light's on. I know my solar iron is up to temperature. So, yeah, you see the red light. Um, we now know that we're ready to cut the next section. So, we've got this the overhang that is the remainder of the Dacron that we left on the rear portion. So, what we need to do is we need to take the, the excess off so we have that line of... Um, Oh, what's it called? That that line of dictation, I guess, for our next step. So the really, really easy way of doing this is literally lining your sail out nice and flat on the front. Um, and you need to be careful with this because one slip and you've broken the kite effectively. 
Um, so I use a straight rule for this and lining up, you see, I, I've lined up with the edge of the kite and I'll pull this back a bit. You can see that that's the excess that I'm gonna be taking off. And all we're gonna do is just literally hot cut along this edge and take that excess off. So because you know this is excess, you can just quickly stab it to make sure it's up to temperature, cuts through straight away. And making sure that that line is nice and straight and you can see that it is from the top, nice and slowly, just cutting all the way down. Can I use any soldering iron, Josh? Yeah. Um, again, the, the kind of tip I suggest you use is this sharp kind of rounded tip. Um, but what you'll see after you've done that, you've got this nice flush hot welded edge, which will come in so useful for the next step. Um, and all we're going to do, is we're going to repeat that on the other side. It's a dead easy step, this, to be fair. Um, I, I suggest don't do this if you feel like you're going to sneeze, because uh, take it from me, putting soldering irons through sails that are nearly finished is quite upsetting. Uh, but uh, you can see I've lined that up there. I know it's ready to go. I'm just starting to cut through. One quick note on that soldering iron question. Um... I've burned through some soldering irons after I forgot to turn them off. Um, so uh, my current soldering iron has an auto shut off feature where it like turns itself off after 15 minutes of, of not being used. I definitely recommend that because um, it's really easy to forget to turn them off. Yeah, definitely. Um, auto turn off soldering iron would be such a good thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. That's, um, that's, that is actually quite an important tip. Um, I don't, not necessarily for kites, um, but I do use soldering irons uh, very, very often. You actually can massively damage the soldering iron by um, leaving it on. So especially if you've got an expensive one that doesn't have an auto off. Um, yeah, just just keep in mind, don't, don't burn your house down, turn your soldering iron off. Um, also, before Josh carries on this next bit, um, I just want to say it is very, very easy to do. Okay, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, it's it's going to be swapped around, so you can't see it. <laughs> I have just donated um, my... Oh, you can't see it. I've just donated to charity. Now, I haven't... I can't enter. I can't enter because we're running it, but it's very easy to do. So pick the charity of your choice and make a donation now. It's, you only have to do a very, very small amount. So there we go. All right, Josh, I've taken the spotlight. You, go for it. You didn't need to do that, Matt, but that's great. Thank you for that. Um, Sorry. Right. right. Um, so I've turned my soldering iron off because we, we will need it again. So keep it close, but we're not going to need it for the time being. Um, I'm going to adjust. Can we, um, can we switch to the front facing camera for this section? Uh, there we go. Uh, right, okay, so, uh, is that front facing yet? Uh, I can't actually see what you guys are seeing, so I hope you guys can see just in front of me. Okay, so you need to just tilt it down very slightly. That's How's it. that? That's, that's perfect, there we go. Perfect, right. If you suffer from a bad back, I strongly suggest standing up at this point because it's a good chance to get on your feet. <laughs> no more other reason than that. Um, so we're gonna actually just take the sail away for a minute because we actually don't need it for a couple of minutes. Um, where are we? Ah, there it is. So. Again, this is where we're coming back into our Daffron usage. Um, and I say you need roughly two meters for this length, uh, but I use just one continuous length and cut it as it's required. But all we're gonna do, um, and this is the part of putting leading edges on, which 
will destroy your fingers if you do it often enough. Um, I've literally had my fingers turn blue by folding Dacron. It, it can be really painful. Um, but we're going to just go along um, and we're just going to fold the Dacron in half. Literally just so matching the two edges all the way along. And so just we're going to be left with a, a, a 25 mil strip folded into. Absolutely. Um, and we're going to do that for what you roughly estimate to be the length of the kite. If you want to be exact, you can measure this up against the kite so you don't have much wastage. But um, I use this entire roll will be folded for me. So I'm just going to fold it as much as I think I need it to be. Uh, but all you're going to do is just match those two edges and just run that crease in with your finger. And you can see why your fingers would turn blue after a while if you do this long enough. Josh, if you uh, tear off a small bit of paper and stick it under your finger as you're running it along, it will save your finger. That's a very good idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. So yeah, we're just running along and you can sort of get a rough idea when you think you've got the right amount. Um, so can I also suggest that, um, I'm, I'm sure Dwight is watching, but it, it looks like a, an engineering solution there for um, to, to help the folding process. I'm just saying, you know, if you happen to have a, a spare five minutes and and I, I mean, even something to put on the end of your finger, <laughs> just, we, just something, uh, yeah, ergonomic. We have a question. <laughs> we have a question in the chat, Josh, from uh, Mr. Brett Marshall. He said he wants to know when you're going to do some kite tails. When I'm going to do some kite tails. Um, <laughs> the, the simple answer to that, Brett, is I'm not. And that's the polite answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right, so I think I think I've got the right amount there folded. You can go back and fold it more if you turn out you haven't. Um, so what I'm going to show you guys now is the way, the simple way of doing a leading edge tunnel. And there are many additions you can do to this. You can do folded edges so that you get effectively a no fray edge. And if you guys want to do that, you are more than welcome. Um, but I'm going to show you guys the simple way because this is intended to be a beginner's lesson. Um, but if you do want to do a folded edge, uh, sorry, a, a no fray edge, you just fold it back on itself and match the angles. Um, but for this one, we're literally just going to do the simple option. Um, so what I'm going to do now is along this folded piece of Dacron. Um, our trusty tape that we use, I'm just going to run a length of that all the way along one side of the Dacron. And this yellow tape that I'm using is an ATG tape um, from 3Ms. I strongly suggest if you're going to continue if you guys want to build more of these, it will help you out so much. Um, give the guys a call. Uh, you say yellow ATG, ATG tape. They'll know exactly what you need. You need a six mil diameter. Um, there are a few varieties, but if you ask them, they'll be able to help you out. Um, so I've run the tape along the folded Dacron. And now I'm just going to peel off in sections. Now you can see... On the, I gave you guys a template for a leading edge um, uh, mesh. I don't know if you've got yours there, Matt. I, my templates are not around. <laughs> I have my template. Hold on. Here we go. There, there you go. So if you just show that to the camera, Matt, so you can see. It's all in so reverse, what, but you can you can see. It's not in reverse. Oh right, okay. <laughs> so what you can see there is um, that gives you ultimate dimensions of what the leading edge should be. So you've got your 20 mil for your mesh and your 25 mil for your Dacron. 
Now, because we've folded the Dacron down, it is 25 mil. But what we're going to do um, is we're going to use effectively some way of measuring to make sure that you've got an exact 20 mil of exposed mesh. Um, and the really, really easy way that I like to do that is if you get a white piece of paper, draw a line. So yeah, let's switch back to this. And just draw a line anywhere that you want. It's really, the first line is not important. And then just, if you get a paralleling line at 20 mil, you will save yourself so much time by trying this method. Um, and just, yeah. So this, this darker patch here that you can see, that is our 20 mil exposed area. And we're gonna use this to measure up the distances that we need for the leading can edge. Can you just show that to camera, please, mate? It's just literally a black squiggle of 20 mil. <laughs> right, okay, yeah, so yeah. Uh, two lines parallel to each other, 20 mil apart. Yeah, uh, use white paper because, yeah, it's just gonna have a good um, contrast. Uh, yeah, obviously, if you're building kites that are burgundy, use something a bit darker. So make sure you've got that contrast effectively. Um, right, so just going to adjust this now. So what I'm doing, um, how's that view for you guys? Can you see? So yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, we can see. I'm, we can see. I'm aligning the Dacron with that top line. And that I know that I need to align the sail with this bottom line. So what you're gonna do there is just work your way along the sail, matching that distance. Uh, okay, cunning. Really simple little kind of hack there for you. Yeah, I have to say, when you first started doing it, I thought, oh, God, that, that seems like a... a like Monotonous. A, uh, yeah, an unnecessary amount of work. But actually, it's not it's not difficult at all, is it? It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a perfect solution to get that perfect uh, leading edge. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I can't take credit for this. Um, as I mentioned before, um, there's, uh, the guy who taught me to build kites suggested this was an easy way of going around many things. Um, initially, he said, like, use a six mil black line um, for your overlap when you're sticking kites together. And that was the way I did it for a long time. Um, but I still use this method for leading edges. Um, and all you, yeah, so you're just working your way along. Um, and you can see that actually it is making a pretty constant width. Um, again, just take your time with this part because it's so more. Uh, Ian has asked, have you uh, ever considered putting a light under your table to turn it into a light table? Yes. Um, and I normally do do that, but... Uh, I've run out of sockets in this room for cameras and chargers and sewing machines and such. <laughs> so it's a hardware failure that's let you down on that. It's a total grey area. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and also, Brett like... says that you're a very, very good artist um, with your, your drawing there. Oh, thank you, Brett. Uh, if you want, I will sign it and send it across for you. <laughs> I think you should. I think you should. Be sure to charge him for it. Oh, yeah. A, a charitable donation of at least $3, you know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I have to say that there's a few individuals that have donated, uh, and you will all know who you are. They stand a very, very, very good chance of... Uh, of winning one of these kites uh, because they have donated some ridiculous amounts um, to their specific charities. Uh, 
So I haven't seen an awful lot of um, kites being made by you guys. Um, but I would love to see more. I want to know what colours you guys are using. Um, yeah, we do want to see. So, oh, look, here we go. Right, I really so want to look, see Riches. Let, let's have a look at Mark. So first of all, let's see Mark's. Uh, there he is. Yeah, there's Mark's. And Mark's not actually using Icorex for his. Um, what what were you, what are you what fabric are you using, Mark? Um, this is slightly heavier. This is 41 uh, grams material, but uh, probably be quite interesting to see how this flies afterwards. Yeah, um, and luckily, I think I'll be one of those one of those people that actually gets to see it fly. Yeah, um, you'll get to so, yeah. well, you get to fly it afterwards. <laughs> Anybody yeah, that's coming up Dunstable. <laughs> yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so yeah. anybody that comes up Dunstable will get to fly it. So. Yeah, well, that's that's a, that's a good reason for, for heading up. Now, Rich, have you got your kite to hand? Uh, okay, here we go. Here's Rich. Now, this is uh, this is an absolute masterpiece. I'm just in love with his colours. Okay, let's unmute. Yeah. Uh, it's all it's all joined together now. Wow. Um, right, it's and he's silver. got he's got the mesh on. He's actually got the mesh and the reinforcement. So well oh. done. Well done. Um, yeah, that's awesome. That is pretty damn good, mate. Yeah. Um, there is one that we haven't seen, and I really like this one because it's my two favourite colours. Is um, Mr. Matt? Can you can you show a, a version that you've been building? <laughs> uh, yes, I definitely can. Although it's not anywhere near as progressed as uh, the rest of you, because I may have been slacking slightly. But in my defence, I've had work. Uh, so let me go and let me go and get my uh, kites. Yeah, my two favourite colours, um, but I'm biased. <laughs> um, I'm just going to take a quick two-minute break while we have these colour show off, and then I will show you guys the next step. Okay, so um, whilst Josh is away, having it a, a little break, I'm going to take the camera and um, oh, it's upside down so we have kite number one uh i wonder why josh likes this one quite so much that is a beauty because it's because it's red and black you did really well with that matt yeah i have to say this is uh it just looks nice. so clean and nice yeah, definitely, definitely some nice colours. And then we have uh, another one that I've been working on for um, my esteemed co-host, Mr. Chris Meldrum. This oh, is we're showing it live for the first time. And so this is this is Chris's that we've been working on. Okay. Now that hasn't had any stitching done at all yet. Some nice, nice shades of grey in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you've got a great beautiful going on there. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's not quite fifty in there, Josh. Um, it's not quite fifty. Not it's quite fifty. Uh... No. no. And then we we'll have one more, which is absolutely lovely. And then we have. my good friend Brian who I really hope is got to um to have in his D Dog colours. I, I have one of those sitting across on my table that looks exactly like that. Yeah. Okay, so there we go. That's mine. Now does anyone have any that they want to share? Anyone else got any? Can you come and join us on Zoom or send us a picture? I also, um, I, there was something random I saw in a forum the other day. There's people talking about what snacks they eat while they're building kites. Um, and I don't know about you, but my snack has to be Red Bull and brownies. Yes. Favourite uh, kite making snack. Do you know what? I'm terrible. I, I don't eat. Um, I know you wouldn't think it would size me, but Actually, when I'm working, my, my brain sort of switches off and I can go for 
hours and hours without consuming anything. Water and jerky. Nice. Nice. Uh, so that, that sustains you for the long haul, does it, Chris? Sadly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Josh, what, what camera are you after? You I'm after the it? front camera. Front camera. Okay, here we go. Mm. So back to Josh. Let me oh. just uh, get, get <laughs> just rid of the Red Bull. <laughs> right, so um, we're at this stage now. Um, and what we need to do now is, um, is we need to actually cut our Dacron tunnel to shoot. Um, and what I suggest you guys do, um, I put the, the leading edge template with the dimensions in for two purposes. Um, and what you, what you will find is that if you use, there it is, that's the one. Uh, it's making me frustrated that I don't have that. <laughs> um, but if you align the, um, the template with the edge of the kite, so you can actually put that template in here and you'll see that it lines up. You can actually mark on your cut lines. Um, but if you don't have that option, just literally like we did before, just follow that line of your trailing edge. Um, and I, for when I do this and I don't have a template, if you fold the kite over, so as if your tunnel would be complete, and then fold it back on itself so it aligns with the trailing edge, you get to see that, um, that mark, and then you can add your additional cut line. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. Total sense. Right. Um, yeah. And you're going to... We'll cut that now. Um, if the red light... Yeah, red light's on. It's up to temperature. So, again, like we were cutting with the panels, you're cutting away from the kite. Um, so to the outside. And I'm going to gonna start by using some of the wasted area just to make sure it's up to temperature so you know you're going to get your clean cut. Um, and then you're just going to follow that line that you've pre-marked all the way across. And again, lining up with the second side because there's two sides to this. And just run it down. And what you get there little arrow shaped fold which once you complete it should be nice and flush with the edge and indeed it is and i'm just going to repeat that process on the other side so whilst you're doing that i've um peter sent me a uh picture so i'm actually going to uh just show you guys here hopefully you can see that can everybody see oh, that? that nod your heads yeah so these are that the kites amazing these are the kites that Peter Peter Tools working on. So thanks for showing that, um, Peter. Anyone Did anyone that's got any pictures, um, by all means, send them to me. Sorry, say that again. What do you? Is anyone making a stack? Oh, is Ooh. anyone making <laughs> a stack? I don't know. Maybe that's Alan. Um, maybe Alan. Do we think Alan might be making a stack? No. That's a great opportunity to get this in. Then actually. Um, a few people had messaged me about stacking these. Um, so I have cut the templates, uh, sorry, not the templates, I've cut the panels for a stack of eight, um, which, I, which I will be um, hopefully bringing back to you guys once it's complete, because it is in fact in on the line colors. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, anybody else got pictures? By all means, send them to me. I want to know if anybody's been making any funky like colours. Like, has anybody gone for teal? Yeah. Or is there any? Uh, is there anyone that's vented? Because I've seen a lot of full sale. I've not seen. A lot of vented. Um, sorry, Matt, I'm just going to dive in there. Yeah, yeah um, of course. 
so I've just finished cutting the excess off. We've used the same process on the other side. Now we go back to the sewing machine. So if you guys want to stick your soldering irons away and plug your machines back in. And we're actually at the final stage now where after we've done this line of stitching, the sail itself will be complete. There's a lot of coming and going tonight. Get your soldering out, get your sewing machine out, get your soldering iron out, get your soldering mach your sewing machine out. <laughs> so we're on the last part. Yeah. Exciting. So. <sighs> now, um, I do realize that um, last week uh, we did um, talk about the bridal, uh, the plans for the bridal, and that we would release them in the week. Now, uh, in fairness to Josh, Josh did actually supply me with the bridal plans. I do have them in my possession. Uh, however, I took one look at them and thought, hmm, well, as we're not doing the bridal this week, and this will need some explanation, we will save it until at the end of the show. So after the show tonight, this evening, I will be posting up the bridal plan. So that they, they do exist. They, I do have them in my possession and you will have them after the show tonight. So um, keep your eye out for a, for a post. I will actually pin it to the top so that anyone coming onto the page in the next few days, right at the top of the page, you'll see the, the bridal plans there. And we will um, explain them in next week's show. I would like to add actually, because um, when I sent them to Matt, you, admittedly Matt was very, very confused about them. Um, and then thanks, I- th Thanks Josh, I, I wasn't gonna mention that. Um, <laughs> Sorry mate. Obviously I understand everything that gets sent to me um, because I'm, I'm some form of genius, but actually once they were explained to me in a, shoot, a few short sentences, um, then, yeah, my, my world had sort of been changed and for bridal making uh, forevermore. So hopefully that's quite exciting for uh, next week. Uh, there's a couple of questions, Josh, if you don't mind answering them. Um, yeah. Uh, this is from Peter uh, Jansen. Uh, when I build a vented or mid-vented uh, mini poles, how must I make the mesh? So which panels? Now, the, the good thing is about the mini pulse is the, the panel layout makes it very easy to put vents in, right, Josh? Yeah, so that's going to be your C2 and your C4 panel. So a C2 on its own for a mid vent, is that right? No, C4, oh, sorry, C4 for a mid vent. Yeah. And a C2 and a C4 if you want a full vent. Yeah. Right, um, can we switch back to... Uh, machine view? Yeah, uh, we've just got a oh, sorry. couple of extras. Um, Josh, on your personal kites, do you roll the leading edge inside or do you straight cut? Uh, I roll on the inside on my personal, uh, personal okay. kites. Okay, and Simon, uh, Simon Franks. Hi, Simon. Um, Simon Frank says, uh, what temperature does Dacron cut at? Um, I don't know the exact temperature to be truthful, but um, I my soldering iron is set to 400 degree, uh, 450 degrees, and I've never had any problems at that temperature. It's never been too hot or too cold. Okay. Perfect. One, on, the, on the rolling of the edge part, um, I think, Josh, you mentioned you roll it, you roll it on the inside. Is that right? Yes, but I stitch it to the inside with the um, yeah with the bit of excess that's there, so that it doesn't block the the rods and doesn't get pushed out when you put the rods through. So the one the one thing that I've been doing is I, I do an extra layer, so I, I roll it on the outside on the actual tube, and then I take an extra layer rolling on the inside and put it in on top of that. So I have two okay. layers folding together where the fold is hidden inside between two layers of Dacron. So then it's perfectly smooth on the inside of the pocket so the rods don't get stuck. Um, but yeah. it keeps it a nice, nice double fold. Oh, brilliant. I might have to, uh, might have to steal that one, mate. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, right, um, we are good to finish this off. Um, so, Matt, what camera would you start? like me? Um, I would like the camera that you've blocked, because for some reason I keep getting a message saying that the host has disabled this camera. <laughs> there we go, far away. You should be able um, to start it now. Uh, hold on. Uh, no, I've just got a purple screen. Hang on, sorry about this. It's all right. Uh, yeah, basically, the uh, we're having to mess around with cameras because we did have a slight bandwidth issue earlier on. Uh, so when we're not using the camera, it's get turned off, but it's a pain to start them again. Here we go. Right. So, Josh. Right. Quite possibly the easiest part of the kite, but also the easiest part to, um, in a sense, mess up because you're on you're, you're on the final stretch. You know, you can see the kite. Um, so what we're going to do is just offer up the cut that we made before and make sure that it perfectly lines up with um, with where it should. Um, and as soon as you can see that actually it does line up, it doesn't, the, the Dacron doesn't go beyond the Dacron on the other side and you can see that it's going to work. Then you're happy to start sewing. Um, and I just line up in there. And straight away, you want to lock off that stitch. So I'm reversing immediately. Um, and again, making sure that it's lined up first. Reversing the stitch in. So there, the stitch is locked in. I can see it's definitely lined up and we're good to go. So all we're doing now is matching the stitch. Um, and I'll just give you guys a quick view of what I can see. Um, so you can see that it's lined up. I'm literally running triple stitch zigzag all the way down here. Same uh, same length as this stitch zigzag that I was using before. And stopping again, I would stop every five, 10 centimeters just to uh, not realign, but make sure that the alignment hasn't shifted and that it's still on the right course. Um, and yeah, and you'll see the kite complete before you know it. Um, so let's uh, let's give it a go. I've lined it up. It's sorry. No, I was going to say it's very exciting because uh, yeah, literally one one row of stitching and more or less there. Indeed. Right. So I've lined it up. I've locked it in. Let's finish this. Just keeping that alignment as close to the edge as you can without slipping off the edge. So obviously you need to make sure that there's enough width in the Dacron tunnel to get the rods through. Um, one thing to take into consideration when you reach the, um, the reinforcement here, you've got four layers of Dacron to go through and uh, like the start, you just want to take that maybe just a little bit slower to make sure the machine's got enough pressure and time to get through it. Otherwise you can sometimes skip stitches. That forward. And casually, as I say that, of course, I didn't wait. <laughs> no, I was going to say, you, you, you do as I say, not as I do, I think is the, the expression, because you rattled through that. But yeah, just give your machines a chance to um, overcome the increased thickness where you've got four layers of Dacron, because uh, I know that's, that's probably if you're gonna break a needle, that's that's the point you're gonna break it, right? Exactly. So while we're stitching this straight stitch, Matt, is there any colours of kites that you want to see people building? Because there's a few colours I think have been missed from the range. Yeah, I mean it's always that thing. We when we think of colours, certainly when I think of colours, I have my sort of default go-to palette. Um, that I use but actually when I see kites in other colours um, you sort of think oh that's really interesting oh I like that or oh, I need to make a kite like that and something that I never really think about is using yellows and golds um, but then as soon as I see them I'm, I'm drawn to them especially when it's like graduated so I know Alan has used that sort of graduated yellow and yellow orangey red um, so I'd, basically any any sort of 
graduated colours. That's what I like to see. Um, like Rich, in fact, and he's done it. He's done it different on both sides, so we've got double bubble. Um, has anyone got any kites they want to show us? Got any any uh, pictures you want to send? I, I want to know if anybody's done any green and grey kites because green and grey kites are the ones which tick the box for me. You're talking about like a dark green, right? Yeah. So obviously, I've gone with the fluorescent green. Yeah. So you want to see the, the darker green combined with what, a dark grey or a light grey? I like kind of a mix of a monochrome. So the full sort of white through light through dark through black. And just with the uh, green highlights. Absolutely. Um, and just as I'm saying that, I'm actually coming up to the end of the, uh, the Dacron now. Um, and it, it is the same process across this entire tunnel. It's just making sure it's aligned and that your stitch is close to the edge. But as I'm coming to the end of it, I'm just going to show you guys how I like to complete these off. So I'm coming up to the last. So I know my three stitches now are going to bring me to the edge of the kite, and that's where I want to seal it off. So I'm lining up that stitch so that the last stitch doesn't fall off the edge of the kite, but I've got enough to reverse and lock that stitch in. So that's my last stitch. And I'll show you guys exactly what I mean by that. That is right, uh, where are we? That's right on the edge of the kite. Yeah, we are very, very close to the edge there. Yeah. So all I'm gonna do now, is that final three step back. And because it's the leading edge and this is the one place you don't want it to fall or uh, to, to separate, it's just double lock that one in. And that's complete. And with that, you cut your final thread, the sale is complete. I do have one, one small note um, of something on the leading edge there. I'd like to go in and identify the spots where we end up cutting holes for fittings later, like along the end tips, wherever the vertical end cap is going to be, and in the middle of the sail. And I tend to put an extra layer of Dacron there because you're cutting in these holes. They're like particular wear points. So I like yes. to put an extra layer of Dacron on top of the leading edge uh, for that. So once you identify where those spots are, then that's a little, a nice little um, improvement. Bonus. Yeah, um, well, we'll just run through that actually, because um, in certainly in two of those places, um, I find that you actually do it without noticing. So um, in the leading edge uh, template, you'll see that there are two holes which are gonna be burned in here and here. And because you've got this reinforcement here, you've actually got four layers of Dacron. If you get a nice sort of weld on that when you pierce your holes with a southern iron, that's really going to give you like a nice strong area. Um, and it's the same here for where the vertical reinforcement goes. Um, what, um, what you just said, and it's actually totally right, is you can actually um, put a extra reinforcement in at the center because there is the bridal um, pressure on there. Um, oh, hold on. Uh, if we can switch back to the front view. Yeah, Matt? you just need to request it, mate. I need to request it? Yeah. Just start the video. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. It's not okay. like you can get in for free. Yeah, no. No, no, no. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so. Uh, yeah. Let's have a look All at right. that, that, that finished sale. Wow. Awesome. That is complete and ready to have the final touches on. So that would be the end caps with the bungees and the bridle and then the frame. And after that point, we're good to go. Um, next week, we will cover burning the holes in the sail. Burning holes in the sail. Yeah, we're, we're just going to go like <laughs> by a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, next week we're going to cover the where we put the, the holes in the sail for the bungees and the bridle. We'll do putting the bungees on um, and making the bridle up and actually even 
framing the thing so it's good to fly. Um, so yeah, as of next week, we'll be complete with this project. And then after that, I still believe we're intending on doing a follow-up, um, kind of a little review and a debrief, and then the raffle drawing to see who is going to get these two kites. Um, yeah, so, so yeah. we're going to do, we're covering the finishing of the sale um, next week. So bridal end caps, as Josh said, uh, and your bungees. And then the week after that, we will be doing a uh, get together, everyone with their finished kites. And we will be doing the draw, prize draw for the two mini pulses live. Um, yeah, so lots to tune in. Now, remember, you have to donate to be included in the draw. Um, it's very, very easy. Choose a charity of your choice, donate three pounds or three euros or three dollars. Simple as that. Um, um, yeah. I will also follow up, by the way, that um, Matt, I can't remember if it was you, but I think it was you that had this awful, awful pink bungee. Was that you? Not guilty. Not was guilty. Okay. Well, if anybody uses me. pink bungee on any of these kites, I will be massively disappointed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, to be honest, if we see pink bungee, we might we might even have to uh, take the kites back, right? Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, it's uh, punishable by, well, I, I can't say death. That's a bit extreme. <laughs> death is a bit extreme. Death is a bit extreme. Um, okay, does anyone have anything? Rich, wh where are you up to with your kite? Good, sir. Let's have a look. Uh, I was falling along. Oh, my goodness me. Wow. Yeah, John. So. Wow. Oh, wow, mate. Well wow. done. Well done. I'm ready to yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so... <laughs> Okay, so uh, Rich has actually managed to finish his kite at the same time as Josh. That's that's impressive. That, wow, that is hard work. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. You've been <laughs> you've been flying through it. Um, did Mark okay. get any further? Did Mark? Well, Mark, I don't think you've been building, have you, Mark? I had to constantly concentrate it uh, I was really having to pay attention to the way those seams yeah, went. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was having to do the same. But I was able to run a little experiment to see what temperature you needed to cut the DAC one at. Now, you can get through at 300 degrees C if you go really slowly. Uh, but between 400 and 450 seems to be the optimum there. That's that's a good shout. Okay, so between 400 and 450 is uh, is a good temperature where you want to be. Uh, okay, does anyone, we'll, we'll just uh, as we're wrapping up, quickly just open it uh, on Facebook and YouTube. If you've got any comments, now's the time to uh, throw them in so that we can rattle through them. I have a question. Anyone got an Amazon link for Pink Bungie? <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Good one. Uh, no, I think Josh has bought up all the supplies, so there is none left. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking like bright fluorescent pink here. If it's like burgundy, that's, that's acceptable. You know? Burgund okay, so burgundy acceptable, pink really not. Okay. Uh, any questions? Did any come through? Okay, no, no questions have come through. So, if you have got any, remember you can watch all of the builds, um, all of the, the previous videos on YouTube and Facebook. If you have any questions, you want us to link you to anything, you can't get a hold of something or other anywhere that you're based, we can steer you in the right direction. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Next week, same time, same place, Josh. Yeah, uh, I just want to roll out a requirement list for next week for what we'll need. Um, okay, so yeah, next week requirements are go for it. So we need our trusty old soldering irons. Um, you'd be happy to know that we are done with sewing machines. Um, we will. Do, I'll release a little like we'll do a bag tutorial in the follow up week if people want it. That'll take five minutes. Um, yeah, so we're gonna need bungees end caps um washers we, we, you guys could do with some three mil washers i think that was on the initial kit list yeah some nylon um, washers yeah bridal line and 
If you have them, this is not essential, but you will need some form of marker. Um, three different color Sharpies. Um, that'll come very apparent next week. And scissors might be helpful, but and, not essential. And the Sharpies should be able to make a mark that will be visible on your bridal line? Yes. So, um, I'll, well, I'll show you guys now just as a little... So I'm going green, red, pink, and a neon orange. Okay. So, and will all of those show on black or? The idea is that they will have some show on black. If you are using black, uh, metallic pens can also be quite useful. I may have just ordered myself a set of metallic Sharpies. I'm quite excited, but then again, I have no life and I'm very sad. So there we go. Aww. Aww. Um, okay, right. I do, do one last quick question. See if there's any questions. Oh, <laughs> Peter's linked us to lots of uh, polyester shot cord in bright pink on Amazon. Uh, really? So, <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> so, so now we're going to have loads of mini pulses that are covered. Okay, Mark, are you um, are you showing are you showing your kite? Can we see where your kite for one last time? Come on, show us where it's at. Yeah, yours. You're on. You're on mute. You're on mute. It, uh, I didn't do it, but uh, the tips that people gave me last week uh, about wiping the needle down with an alcohol. I got myself a bottle of alcohol here, dropped all over the floor. Isopropyl, yeah. Isopropyl alcohol, that worked really well. And also the wetting with a bit of water, that worked really well as well. To stick uh, but, your uh, sails in place. Stick together. But I've, uh, I had to concentrate today, so but I managed to uh, get the machine working. The reason I had that sticky needle uh, was because the machine wasn't timed properly, uh, which seems like a really weird uh, thing to happen. Your needle goes sticky if it's not timed properly, but that I retimed the machine and... Uh, that seemed to sort that problem out. But uh, I shall catch up this week and uh, show you the results for next week. Awesome. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Okay. On that, uh, on that and topic go, of go the glue and things, um, I found a, a significant difference with the type of thread um, that you use. I, I'm typically using a bonded polyester that I get from Thread Exchange. I bought a bonded nylon from Thread Exchange as well. And I used that its same exact width. The only difference is nylon instead of polyester. And I had a horrible time going through going through double sided tape with it, and so I'm like I'm married to my bond polyester now. Like I will not use anything else. Nice. It, uh, I did change the thread actually as, as well. Uh, all of those tips, and uh, they really just made the, the world of difference. That's that's really helpful. Um, Chris, have you got anything to add? He's shaking his head. No. Okay. Um, right, everyone. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, thank you to Mark, Watty, Rich, Chris. Really, thank you, everybody. Uh, ma massive, massive thank you to Josh because as I'm watching him put all this stuff together, uh, things like the the templates that um, e even something like that, if we had that just on its own, that would be a lot of work for him to effectively donate to us. So, um, can, I, mass can I throw one thing out there? Just um, go well. for it. It's like, it's been massively enjoyable doing this entire project. So I, I don't want like, thanks for this. Um, but the only thing that I do want to see is as many people as you can, if you could just send the photos forward to these guys on the line. Um, and there was one thing I forgot to mention, and this is kind of like a really important factor. Is, um, at this point now, effectively you have a nude skin that is just waiting to be done with. It is at its most vulnerable point in the next week. Um, you will, like, I, I know personally that when I have skins at this point, I always, always, always am terrified that I'm going to do something like put a hole in it. Just put it somewhere safe, roll it away, um, and just, yeah, look after it because these things, it's a horrible feeling if you do that. Um, that's a good last tip. Actually, if you if you if people are going to now store their kite with the leading edge on, is there a particular way that you would roll it um, to to preserve? Um, at this point, 
avoid rolling or folding only because you don't want to put any kind of like predetermined creases in there. Once the frame goes in, we, we need to like assess that kind of area where of storing the kites and you don't want to like put too much stress on your Icar X or anything like, or whatever fabric you are using. Um, so yeah, try and avoid rolling and folding at this stage. Okay, so just tuck it out of the way, put it in the ward, hang it up in the wardrobe, you know, do, <laughs> do something or other. Um, get rid of all your wife's clothes and stick the kite in there <laughs> and you'll be absolutely fine. Um, so I'm just going to tell her Josh told me to do it. Okay, right. I don't think we've got any questions. Oh, yes. Geraldine also says away from the cats. Yeah, that's a good shout. Mm. Okay, so, um, right, everyone, uh, thank you very much for all your support. I'm looking forward to uh, same time next week, 8 p.m. UK time. Again, don't ask me about the other times across the world because I don't know. Um, I will come up with a nice chart so I can tell you in the future. Keep a listen out for the podcast that we just had uh, John Baresi on uh, this week's episode. If you haven't listened to it, it's, it's very, very good. So uh, go back. You can find it on YouTube and uh, Podbean and so on and so forth. Um, I think that is it. So once again, thank you from me and um, goodbye. Uh, let's goodbye have some. Thank you. Let's have some waving. Everybody wave. Everybody wave and say goodbye. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>